Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views, with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Blights are awakened plants. In the most basic terms, they are self-aware sentient plant life. In the Blight's case, they are most certainly not your friends. On a deeper level, in the high fantasy worlds of Dungeons and Dragons, the power of life Death, nature, and magic form a complex and incredibly diverse array of different forms of entity. Some are so foreign that there is no equivalent of anything like it to be found in our real world, such as elementals, the undead, and the blights. The Monster Manual of 5th edition includes three examples of the forms that blights can manifest in. It also goes into a bit of detail on the origin story of the blights, which is great, because once you know what, where these things come from, you can really sink your teeth into exactly what form their evil takes and what their motivations are as villainous monsters. One cannot talk about the blights without talking about Ashardalon and the vampire Gulthias. Long ago, Ashardalon was a dominant force of evil across the land, where his cultists worshipped him as a god. The cult of Ashardalon erected their central temple in Nightfang Spire, a massive stone edifice stretching 1,600 feet into the air. This location and the adventure built around it are all of, uh, and all the evil forces involved form the core of the Sunless Citadel adventure series written by Bruce Cordell, certainly one of my favourite adventure writers and a source of great inspiration for the hobby in general. I won't spoil any of the details of the adventure, as you can play a 5th edition version of the uh, the Sunless Citadel in Tales of the Yawning Portal. While living, Gulthias was the intermediary between Ashardalon and his delusional followers, which included a lot of half-dragons, and Gulthias at one point was involved with six experiments on half-dragons, resulting in the creation of half-dragon flesh golems. This is not the, that, that bizarre, considering that Gulthias was under the command of Ashardalon to protect and preserve the dragon's own heart which was carved out of his body even longer ago by a bunch of powerful druids. Well, Ashardalon, little did his cultists know, uh, when he got banished in the process and he was living in another plane of existence, and little did his cultists know that he had no intention of coming back to their world anytime soon. Dragon politics and uh, adventures being what they are, as he was busy breaking a multiversal law and had snuck into the place in the positive material plane where new souls were made, which he was feasting on and growing tremendously powerful. Gulthias knew that Ashardalon was still alive somewhere because he sensed residual power in the detached heart of the dragon, so his body failing, he gathered the cultists and began the process of all of them becoming undead at the same time, using the power of Ashardalon's heart as a catalyst. At this point, one of those great coincidences of the multiverse happened. Gulthias's proximity to the heart raised him as a unique, insidiously powerful vampire, and he was privileged with a certain link to the zombified heart of a Ashardalon. He could raise cultists to unlife and hold sway over them. Always one for drama, Gulthias made Ashardalon's heart his coffin, transforming Nightfang Spire into his own personal, personal mortuary temple. Another aspect of the link to the undead heart was only revealed later on, skipping a lot of history not that important to the Blights because I'm trying to stay on topic here. When a wooden stake was plunged into the heart of Gulthias, he took, uh, this took place in a location called the Sunless Citadel, located on Torrell in the foothills just south of Mount Hotnell, uh, northwest of Thundertree near the city of Neverwinter on the sword coast of the continent of Faerun. Golfias was killed in the Twilight Grove beneath the Citadel. This was a place already heady with dark natural power, as the Citadel was built by el uh, evil elven members of the Cult of the Dragon long, long ago, and later fell into the ravine beneath it, cushioned by some supernatural force. The Citadel was re re reasonably intact. So when a heroic adventurer staked Golfias to the ground, the unique link he had to a Shardalon's zombified heart and the primal uh, dark energy latent in that location served to transform him into an undead tree and he became the source of all twig blights so basically his spirit flowed into the stake and he rose it to unlife so the blights are essentially undead plants with a strange brew of dark power linking them to the consumed souls a zombified dragon heart a fanatical vampire and whatever horrendous ritual darkness the elves originally cooked up beneath the sunless citadel they are all kinds of messed up and thoroughly evil, with a melting pot of very bad urges and a few of the vul few of the vulnerabilities of normal fleshy undead, uh, but also some of the limitations of being just based on plants. 
The Goldfire's tree controls the Blights within a certain range, but they have long since spread out into the world and the multiverse beyond, so they can be encountered almost anywhere. In the Monster Manual, we have three versions, but the range of possibilities is huge, staggeringly huge. So for the purpose of easy adaptation, all Blights have the following traits in common. They generally have an armor class of 12 or 13, depending on the size, but there is nothing stopping them having stone or metal incorporated into or nailing it onto them, which would provide a natural armor class of, um, say, a maximum of 15. Undead vines wrapping around a bunch of boulders formed into a roughly humanoid shape may at first be confused for some some form of earth elemental, and such a creature might be able to hurl boulders exactly like a hill giant. Most blights look exactly like plants, unless they are observed moving, so they can infiltrate any forested area, even towns, and such the uh, smaller ones might pose as potted plants or hedgerows, lying dormant for quite some time until suddenly they strike. Blights have no vulnerability to light, radiant energy, holy water, silver, or anything that specifically targets the undead. In fact, they don't even count as an undead creature type, so they're just vulnerable, uh, just as vulnerable to negative energy and necrotic attacks as normal living things. They have no sense of sight or hearing. They can only detect their immediate environment out to about 60 feet, beyond which they're totally blind. However, in that range, they have a passive perception of around 9 or 10. They are very fast for plants. Needle blights can move at a speed of 30 feet per round, or d twice that fast if they're dashing. They are intelligent with an intelligence of 4 or 5 on average. They can understand common, but are deaf and most of them cannot speak. Vine blights can speak, and I encourage you to develop unusual versions of blight. For, uh, for example, a fruiting blight that can take on the form of a hooded figure who performs contortionist tricks and hands out fruits of different flavors to amused children who later vomit up vicious twig blights, who will attack anyone near them. There is no real limit on how large a blight can be. We could have a couple of medium, one small in the manual, but what about a large, a huge, a gargantuan, a colossal, or an awesome-sized blight? You could easily use the stats for a treant as a huge blight. A gargantuan blight would be around uh, 50 feet high, weighing something like 30 tons, filling a 20-foot area with a uh, 20-foot reach on all its attacks. It would strike with no to-hit bonus. Uh, well, the to-hit bonus would not be much higher than plus 2 or plus 4 with its slam attacks. However, if it has grappling vines or simply trundles and tramples over all of its enemies in its path, it could have a bonus of up to plus 14 to hit them all. So better just uh, allow it as the enemies a simple saving throw for half damage. Otherwise, it will likely crush them all the time. Such a, uh, a two-hit bonus is just too high for 5th edition. Such an enormous creature is a siege weapon, doing twice as much damage to structures and inanimate objects. It has a lot of hit points. Each hit dice is d20. It is very strong, and at that size, able to carry and throw huge amounts of weight. So take a Storm Giant's boulder attack and beef it up by about half again on damage and such. You should be in the rough ballpark of what a reasonable attack, ranged attack for such a creature would be. Also, creatures that size should probably have legendary resistance a couple of times per day, although they may not have any special abilities other than brute physical assault. That level of destruction is impressive enough, if you ask me. No need to overly complicate it. As uh, at Colossal E or the really seen awesome size category, well, dealing with creatures that large is really a subject for a whole other video. Suffice to say, it's easier to treat such creatures as large um, structures themselves, as conflict with them is likely to be at a whole new level of violence, involving vehicles, siege engines, all the fireballs and lightning bolts you can muster, and maybe a meteor swarm prismatic wall, or an actual army of hobgoblin lumberjacks. Your average adventure party might well be able to bring uh, such a creature down, but it's going to be one long and interesting fight. With one set of bad rolls does, uh, resulting in a smear of gore that was previously represented by a character sheet. Uh, a creature that size is damaged from its attacks is not going to mess around. So, what are the motivations and habits of blights in the wild? Actually, they are very similar to the normal motivations of a plant. They want to grow, spread out, dominate the available resources and thrive. However... Blights are evil vegetation. They will actually uproot and poison regular plants and trees. They will spread out and deliberately infect other plant life, trying to take over and corrupt the entire region. 
Infected plants may grow their own central version of a Golfias tree, like the nerve center of their evil collective. Blights grow extremely rapidly, and this is quite noticeable to animals and peoples in the area, who will learn very fast to avoid the wild and verdant growths of the new forest, swamp or jungle. Animals will stray into that uh, stray into the blight forest will be cut off, hedged in, trapped, and then murdered by the plants that come alive to kill them and leave them to rot in the soil, where greedy roots will tear the body apart even before it's fully decayed. Drifts of evil pollen will waft on strong breezes across villages and homesteads too close to the blighted woods, and horrific nightmares, bleeding noses, red and infected eyes, sores on the skin, and poisoned ponds, streams, and wells will be the result. The mobile blights depicted on the monster manual could just be scouts, assassins, and terrorists of the blighted forest, with titanic monster trees building up power back in the deep forest, ready to rise up and march on civilization with thunderous steps. Castles and inland cities may be reduced to vine-choked rubble in only a matter of days once the blight has sufficient mass and numbers to begin its war against the non-plight plant life of the world. However, that is not the only motivation of the Blights, because they are infused with the fanatical will of Gathias himself. The former vampire firmly believed that it was simply a matter of faith, and with enough believers, enough cultists, enough individuals, and a sufficient mass or flow of uh, belief and faith, that a Shardalon would return to rule the world. That it will absolutely happen, and a Shardalon once again will manifest physically in the world. The Blights are infected with the same exact notion, although they don't really stop to consider who a Shardalon is, or why they are working to grow and grow until there are enough of them to call them back into being. But you can imagine how local farmers would be highly perplexed and very suspicious of these miracle beans that were sold by a very unhealthy looking dryad, which indeed grew amazingly well, producing huge vines and incredible bean pods, but kept growing in this exact same repeating pattern, a twisting knotwork with the unmistakable image of a fire-breathing dragon with spread wings on top. This is not normal behaviour for any form of legume, but as the farmers start to attack the vines, they come alive suddenly, coiling around fence posts and rocks, forming unearthly constructs in the shape of giants, farmhouses are torn apart, villages slaughtered, and pretty soon none but a desperate band of survivors makes its way to the next town as refugees, destitute apart from one rescued pig, an ox, a couple of dogs, and a sack of beans they dare not sell anyone, no matter how hungry they become. Perhaps the adventurers are full of curiosity about the bizarre way these farmers, these poor farmers, are behaving around a seemingly harmless sack of dried beans, large beans. It will not be the first time a handful of beans has gone, given everyone no end of trouble. If you are no fan of a Shardalon in the Cult of the Dragon and an undead origin to the Blights, they can easily be adapted to some other source of corruption. For instance, a forest corrupted by the Abyss may give rise to such demon trees. The dark powers of the Fey may breathe supernatural vitality into the woods, if for no other reason than it suits the fickle moods of vicious Fey creatures, monsters, lords and ladies. There is always room for evil plant life. In the case of Blights, think about the terrain and the environment the game is currently taking place in. Um, and if it's a tundra, perhaps the blight is a collective of grasses and tussock. In a jungle, there could be an enormous sundew, uh, vicious Venus five flytraps as large as giant clams. In deserts, there could be cactus giants and coiling roots that drag people under the sand suddenly, or some location where the blight is well known and established, but unable to spread much further, such as the almighty Sarlacc of Star Wars except some sort of carnivorous plant. And in the Underdark, there's no reason why there could not be fungus blights creating legions of deadly toadstool warriors who seek out, seek out fresh meat for the rot pits of the colony. Would a hag stage a mockery of a marriage with her victim carrying an evil bouquet of blight blossoms? Is her cauldron full of potato and body part stew actually a festering soup of baby blight vines? Do fey blights uh, sown by the hag throughout the forest and farms in the area all work together to grow potent, verdant locations that can actually tear open portals to the fey dark letting through the forces of her Fomorian masters? I shall leave the ripe seeds of the blight to take root in your imagination. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise if you feel so inclined, wear your geek with pride. Check out Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.